Hi, it's me and Bobble RBG again. Hello. Well, we have a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. Uh, it might be helpful to you to have, uh, as we go through these slides, to have in front of you a copy of the Bill of Rights, like the one that was provided to you in class. It might be helpful to have that packet of 23 Supreme Court case summaries that you've been provided with. It might be helpful to you to have another one of the handouts that was provided to you. This one is a listing of uh, important freedom of speech Supreme Court case decisions. And finally, it might also be helpful for you to have, towards the end of the video, a, another handout that was provided to you. This one listing uh, the legal limitations on the freedom of speech. Congress shall make no law, yada, 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 abridging the freedom of speech. Thank you. You know, some of my students might not know what abridge means. Do you mind explaining that word to them? Of course. To abridge means to shorten or to curtail or limit. So here it means that Congress cannot pass laws limiting our freedom of speech. So before we get into the details, I just want to say at the outset that uh, just as we saw with the freedom of religion, um, your freedom of speech is not absolute. Uh, there are some legal limits to your freedom of speech. You cannot say whatever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want, to whomever you want, in any way you want. Um, <clears throat> I think what I just said is proof because I'm not sure an English teacher would approve of what I just said in every respect. Anyway, uh, for example, this is an easy example I think I gave in class already. You know, someone might have um, <clears throat> the freedom of speech to sing at the top of my lungs. <clears throat> oh, sorry. But if it's at three o'clock in the morning, well, that interferes with my right to get some sleep. So with all these rights that we're going to be that we already have discussed and that we're going to be discussing they all have limits because other people live in the world and they have rights too so my rights stop when they start interfering with someone else's rights i also want to point out here that just because of the first few words of the first amendment congress shall make no law uh don't take that too literally um there's always exceptions uh, our courts always have to find a balance between individual rights and the rights of society. Um, <clears throat> they always have to interpret what's reasonable in this situation or in this real life situation. And so over the years, the courts have carved out lots of exceptions to what we call our freedom of speech. And just another one last word of warning, uh, students, you don't do so well here. You, uh, on balance, um, you're not that protected at your stage of life. Uh, same deal with due process, but we'll cover that in another video. We're going to look at freedom of speech uh, two different ways. First, uh, we're going to run down this list of um, famous and semi-famous Supreme Court cases having to do with freedom of speech. First up, just happens to be a required by the College Board case that you have to know for the AP exam, Schenck versus U.S. It's pronounced Schenck, not Schneck. I don't know why people can't read that. It's Schenck versus U.S. In, from back in 1919. It's now over 100 years old. And the upshot of that case is that you can be punished for speech that endangers society. Um, someone, uh, Mr. Schenck, was uh, during World War I advocating that young men not appear for their draft assignments for, to go into the war. Um, the Supreme Court said, well, that is just too dangerous to society. We're in war. Um, we need soldiers. And saying that soldiers don't have to serve and trying to convince them not to serve represented a clear and present or immediate danger. So it became known as the clear and present danger test. Uh, if someone's speech represents a clear and present danger to society, uh, it can be legally limited and punished. You've all heard a, um, a famous, uh, it's almost a cliche, actually, um, in, our, in our society. You can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. Um, that word or that, those words or that example is straight from the majority opinion in the Schenck versus U.S. Uh, case. It was given as an example because obviously... Um, if someone were to do that, that would cause unnecessary 
uh, threat to people's lives. It would cause unnecessary uh, th threat of danger to property. Um, society has a right to be free from that sort of speech. And Schenck himself was endangering the United States uh, by trying to convince uh, young men not to appear for the draft assignments. So um, <clears throat> it's a landmark Supreme Court decision. The clear and present danger test is a famous one that could easily appear on an AP exam. So please make sure you understand this case and refer to the, uh, that other packet of, of decisions or look it up on the internet. Um, it's a great case to remember. The next case uh, we've already talked about in 1925, the Gitlow case, um, it was decided that uh, what he was saying was uh, too dangerous, too threatening, too upsetting to our social order for him to get away with saying what he was saying. And the state of New York could legally punish him. But however, in that decision, the Supreme Court also pointed out that if the facts were a little different, New York would be required by the First Amendment to respect freedom of speech. So this is considered to be the very first example of selective incorporation. The next case on this slide, 1942, Chaplinsky, um, is the source of what we call the fighting words doctrine. There are some words that uh, when you say them to someone else, they're just so outrageous, they're so angering that they are very, very likely to cause uh, violence and fighting. So those sorts of words can be legally uh, punished and prohibited. And at this point, I want to point out that the Schenck, the Chemplinsky cases were decided during wartime, and the Gitlow case um, had its origins right after World War I um, and was litigated or was in the court system in the early 1920s during our first Red Scare. Um, this is interesting to note because uh, the Supreme Court was fairly restrictive of our freedom of speech, and the reason why is pretty clear. We were in an emergency. We were under threat. We were at war, or we thought we were under attack by communists, and uh, the message here is that uh, this is you, you've seen you'll see this pattern in American history that w during a times of crisis when fear is heightened um, and society in general feels that uh, the nation is at risk, um, the Supreme Court will often uh, kind of shrink our rights. When cases like this come up, they will often interpret the Constitution a little more narrowly and not permit as much freedom as we kind of think we should have had if we look back. Uh, just ask a guy named Fred Korematsu. Uh, you'll understand that when we get to the video on uh, due process. The next two cases provide a, an interesting distinction. Uh, in 1951, in the Dennis case, um, he was guilty of actually advocating, uh, trying to get other people to overthrow the United States government, and that was found by the Supreme Court to be um, an illegal thing. Um, not surprising, pretty much every government on earth says you can't go around saying, hey, let's overthrow our government. Uh, six years later, there was a slightly different case, uh, the Yates case, where the person was trying was uh, being punished for saying that he thought the government should be overthrown. So there's a difference, but and, and the Supreme Court said that's okay. There's a difference between saying, "Hey, let's actually overthrow the government," and saying, "Yeah, it should be overthrown." One's uh, take kind of, kind of leading to action, and the other is just expressing an opinion. For example. Uh, an actual communist who tries to organize other people to uh, carry out a communist revolution in this country, that would be illegal. A professor in a, in a college who's explained to his students, Here what, here's what Marx thought, here's what Marx said was going to happen, and the, there's eventually going to be this revolution where the, the capitalism is overthrown and blah, 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 blah. Um, that's okay because it's speaking, you know, it's educational, it's speaking uh, hypothetically, it's, it's speaking academically. It's not actually trying to carry into effect what the guy is teaching. Uh, the next case is pretty interesting too. 1964, New York Times versus Sullivan. Um, I, I encourage you on your own, this is not a required case, but I, I think you would find it interesting if, if you were to look up um, information about it. Uh, basically, look at the time period, 1964. Uh, this came out of the civil rights movement and specifically the, um, <clears throat> the uh, protests in Alabama of 1963. The, the cruel actions taken by the, uh, the police 
in those protests. Uh, the head of the police was, or one of the heads of the police was a guy named Sullivan. And uh, something was published in the New York Times criticizing what Sullivan had done. And he sued the New York Times, um, claiming slander, that, that he had been personally attacked wrongly and damaged his reputation. Um, and this is a really important uh, Supreme Court case, and I'm surprised it's not on the college board's list because I, I think it is really important. Uh, the Supreme Court said, no, you know what? If you're a government official, you can't just uh, kind of protect yourself by suing somebody because they some, say something bad about you. Uh, and it makes perfect sense. I mean, in a democracy, you have to talk about the issues. You have to talk about the government. You have to talk about people in the government. Sometimes you're going to say something bad about the people in the government and what they're doing. Um, and you have to be able to say that safely without fear that they're going to sue you. So in the interest of a, you know, a healthy flow of information and discussion that makes it, that is necessary in a democracy, um, the Supreme Court said, no, no, no. If you are a government official... Uh, we're going to set the bar so high. We're going to make it so hard for you to successfully sue somebody for what they say about you that you might as well not even try. You have to prove actual malice. That means intentional, I'm sorry, intentional disregard for the truth and, uh, for your reputation. That means you have to say something knowing it was false and intentionally saying it anyway, just for the sake of hurting someone's reputation. That is really, really hard to prove in a court of law because it goes to intent. <clears throat> it had, you, know, you have to prove that somebody knew what they were saying was false and they said it anyway. So it's almost impossible for a public fixture, a fixture, a figure, a public, uh, uh, government in, in official to prove that. So basically what it does is it, it makes you uh, almost, uh, you know, unlimited freedom in saying what you want about government people. Here we have two symbolic speech decisions right next to each other. In the first one, you've all seen the pictures or read about during the Vietnam War, how some people um, <clears throat> didn't want to didn't uh, serve when they were drafted. And you've probably seen pictures of um, people burning their draft cards as a form of protest. It's not speech speech, it's not words coming out of your mouth, but it's saying something through actions, which is what symbolic speech is. Well, in this case, um, Mr. O'Brien was uh, convicted, and the Supreme Court upheld that conviction because he wasn't burning his own property. He was burning government property, the draft card. So that form of speech is not protected by the First Amendment. In the next case, uh, students um, perk up your ears because you win this one, and it is a required case by the College Board. In this case, and I, I, in past years, I'm wondering if you if you didn't study this or write something about this in your English classes. Um, you, um, <clears throat> this was another Vietnam War era protest case. These are two students at a high school in Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, they planned a protest, um, a silent, non-violent protest, simply by wearing armbands around their their black armbands around their 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 arms, obviously, um, to protest the people being killed in the Vietnam War. Um, out of fear of disruption to the school day that the the principal got got wind of this planned protest and started suspending students before they were able to carry it out um their case made it to the supreme court and very famously so famous that it's one of the required cases the supreme court said well students have a right to speak politically Students have a right, in this case, to protest silently. Uh, it's not going to be disruptive to the school day. It's not going to hurt anybody. They're just saying, they're just giving their opinion on, on a topic of the day, an important political topic of the day. Um, and that that's, the principal had no right to uh, suspend them. Uh, that their protest, their symbolic speech, was constitutionally protected by the, the First Amendment's Freedom of Speech Clause. Um, I encourage you to look up information that you have in that other packet of cases. Uh, some famous words from that decision um, could easily pop up on a test. And uh, yeah, don't, uh, don't let this suffice for your study of that case. 
Next, um, if memory serves, uh, the Brandenburg case is a little bit of a stepping back from what the Supreme Court said in previous cases. Um, I believe Brandenburg got away. What he was saying uh, was not the kind of speech that would immediately lead to violence. So uh, the Supreme Court said, you know, you can get away with this. Um, it's okay to say things that are controversial. It can, it's, it, it's okay to say things that are upsetting to other people. That's sort of part of life. Uh, but as long as they don't immediately cause violence... Um, Supreme Court backed up uh, what Brandenburg had been saying. The next case, Fraser. Um, students take a hit here. Again, um, speaking obscenities in school at various types of school events is uh, punishable. In 1988, uh, Hustler magazine during, uh, versus Falwell. Um, uh, Falwell uh, said things critical of the owner of that magazine and uh, it's interesting here that um, the previous case I just told you about, the uh, New York Times versus Sullivan, where, this, where the Supreme Court said that uh, basically you can say almost anything you want about government officials, um, kind of expanded that decision uh, to protect people who are just kind of in the news, uh, uh, widely known in the public, famous, uh, widely discussed about in the news. Um, those those kind of people are also uh, inevitably going to to have things said about them, and the Supreme Court said, well, there's there's a limit to what they can gain by by suing for slander or libel. So it expanded on the Sullivan decision that was specifically about government officials, and said that basically public figures um, are to some degree in the same category. The next case from 1988. Um, in order to protect uh, the privacy of people in their own homes, um, protesting near a private residence or near private, someone's private property could be legally limited. In 1988, the uh, students, uh, I'm sorry, you take another hit here. Uh, in the Hazelwood case, which I think was specifically about uh, publishing something in a school newspaper, um, the Supreme Court said that uh, basically, uh, your freedom of speech could be limited in a variety of other ways. Um, 1989, a very famous case. I'm kind of surprised this is not on the college board's list, to be honest. Um, Texas versus Johnson. Uh, he was guilty of burning the American flag during a protest in Texas, which violated state law. And when it, his case got to the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court said, well, we're not wild about this, but um, that kind of speech, that kind of symbolic speech is constitutionally protected. It's a, and a lot of people have, have complained about this decision. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's obnoxious to burn the American flag. You're probably not going to make many friends or get many people to agree with you. But uh, the Supreme Court has said it is protected, symbolic speech. Um, the only thing that can be limited is, is obviously setting fire to something is a dangerous thing. So you have to do it in a place where it's legal to burn anything. But as long as you're in that situation, you can burn the American flag as a form of protest. Um, the next case... From 1990, the Eichmann case, uh, that was a, a U.S. federal law that said flag burning is illegal, and the Supreme Court came up with the same decision. Uh, it is illegal to uh, ban that form of speech. Another freedom of speech case from the year 2000, uh, the Hill case, uh, was sort of related to the abortion controversy. Um, protesters would set themselves up outside of abortion clinics um, uh, you know, making noise, chanting, blah, 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 uh, to try and dissuade people from going in to, um, uh, abortion clinics to, to, um, have that done. And the Supreme Court said that does violate their privacy of people going in and out of these places. So I think what it said was a, a they set a, a distance limit. They couldn't be within a certain distance of abortion clinics if they wanted to protest. Um, which speaks to, you know, time, place, and manner restrictions. It is legal for local governments to, you know, it's not what you're saying, it's kind of how and where you're saying it. Uh, time, place, and manner restrictions are perfectly legal. Uh, in 2007, um, uh, my, 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 case, my students have always uh, kind of liked re learning about this case. Uh, I think this is in Alaska. 
uh, a stu- there was a kind of a school function, kind of a parade or something. And as a student was off school grounds, I think it was actually like a Saturday or something too. Uh, and he, he came up with a sign that literally said bong hits for Jesus. Um, and he was suspended for uh, his sign and he was claimed freedom of speech and it made it to the Supreme court, believe it or not. And he lost, um, basically because it, it, it seems to, it had the flavor of encouraging drug use. Um, so, uh, that kind of behavior, that kind of speech, even though the sign itself doesn't make much sense anyway, um, it did seem to encourage drug use. So, uh, the Supreme court, uh, said that his punishment was legal. The 2010 Citizens United case has already been studied in our course so far. Uh, It is a required case. Make sure you uh, have this in your memory and be ready for it in case it pops up on a test. Remember, um, it was a it was a very controversial, still is a very controversial case because previously passed federal laws that banned corporations and labor unions from spending money on campaigns. Uh, during elections, or in other words, electioneering, those laws were struck down. And ever since 2010, um, uh, corporations and labor unions have been able to spend as much money as they want uh, on on campaign advertising for or against issues for or against candidates. Uh, It's led to the creation of what we call super PACs, and it's it's helped... um, uh, create this this just gigantic explosion of money uh, being being spent in our elections. Uh, but it is ultimately a free speech case. Uh, we studied it back when we studied elections. Um, th- it's a free speech case, so it deserves to be mentioned here again. Remember to study it. It could easily show up on a test. So that wraps up the uh, that one handout. Uh, if you could have the other one out that's titled uh, Legal Limits on Freedom of Speech, uh, maybe I can help you understand some of those things that might not be uh, immediately clear to you. So seditious speech. Sedition is uh, advocating or planning the overthrow of the government. Any sort of speech like that, and again, you know, it's not like the United States government is weird about this. Every government prohibits this. Um, <clears throat> just to kind of break it down for you, uh, doing something that endangers the security of the nation. Uh, make sure you remember the Schenck case and the clear and present danger test. Uh, actually at encouraging the overthrow of the government. Uh, actually urging, inciting people to, to start a riot or commit crimes. Um, threats uh, to public safety, like a bomb threat or, or yelling fire in a crowded theater. Those are all illegal. And then fighting words, uh, uh, using words that are just so enraging to other people that you, you're intending to provoke immediate violence. All of these forms of speech can be, and mostly are legally, uh, uh, prohibited by law. If you defame someone, uh, you, uh, you ruin their good name, you uh, insult their character, you damage their reputation. Um, if it's spoken, it's called slander. If it's published, it's called libel. And in this case, uh, it's not that these things are illegal, it's not that they're crimes, but you can be sued by the person you're saying these things about, uh, which makes it a civil punishment. Um, these are grounds to be, uh, punished in a sense for what you've said. Um, now New York times versus Sullivan, remember, uh, protects uh, you from what you've said about government officials. And in another case that was expanded to include, you know, more or less public figures, but regular persons, regular people, uh, if you say something insulting about them and it's not true and you, you said it anyway, um, you could be sued and in a sense punished for what you've said. So obscenities or indecent speech, uh, can also be punished, um, Usually uh, you hear about this, the most obvious uh, thing that you might know of in your life is uh, the fact that certain words get bleeped out during movies or TV shows, if it's during prime time and if it's on broadcast TV. Um, the, uh, the, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, does have rules that uh, 
broadcast TV and radio stations have to follow. Now, cable is different. The rules are different from them because they're not broadcast. Um, but anyway, so that is a form of speech that can be punished. Um, even in public, uh, this doesn't happen very often, but you know, every once in a while you read about somebody who just went a little too overboard. Maybe they were drunk and saying obnoxious things, um, that, you know, in, in public where there's families and children possibly involved, uh, lots of local governments have rules about what you can say out loud and you might, you might see people get thrown out of, you know, the ball game or something. Um, certain things can't be sold to minors. You would know what those are better than me. I'm not going to describe those things, but anyway, those are all forms of indecent or obscene speech that can be legally limited. So lots of, uh, commercial speech can be limited. Uh, speech by corporations uh, has a few more restrictions on them. Um, for example, the uh, FTC uh, enforces false advertising laws. Uh, co corporations and companies do not have the right to tell you untrue things about their products. Um, things that, that have to be on products, you know, uh, labeling and, and product warnings. Um, you know, corporations don't want to put that stuff on their products, but the law can say they have to. Um, product depictions, like maybe you've wondered about this. How come you never see anybody actually drink something in a TV commercial? And, uh, when I was young, um, there was, there were t cigarette commercials all over the place. Seems like every other commercial was a Marlboro commercial when I was a kid. Uh, that's all banned now. Um, freedom of speech does not protect those companies. Um, the federal do not call list attempts to, to stop, uh, companies and organizations from calling you at home, uh, that would be seen as a limit on their free speech. And that is perfectly legal insider trading. Uh, we, if you looked over the, uh, securities and exchange commission handout, I gave you about a month ago or so now, um, insider trading is using information that you and you only have to buy or sell stocks on the stock exchange. Um, it's called insider trading because you have a inside connection to a company and you have more knowledge about a company than the rest of the public does. Uh, that is seen as having an unfair advantage over all the other investors in society. So that kind of speech, sharing information about a company or a stock that the, the public in general does not have, it's called insider trading and it is illegal. Other forms of speech that can be considered illegal would be discriminatory speech, such as hate speech or hate crimes. Um, hate speech itself can be punished, or and uh, hate speech, uh, if it accompanies a crime, can lead to a, a tougher penalty. Uh, sexual harassment, um, very rightly, is considered discriminatory speech and can be punished, um, either criminally or civilly. Uh, student speech, sorry guys. Um, you can be punished for a whole lot of things that you would consider free speech, like the words you say, uh, talking back to a, to a person in authority, uh, certain things you might wear on your clothing. Um, you might claim freedom of speech for these things, but because you are minors, because you're under our protection, uh, the law, generally speaking, backs us up. Now the Tinker case, make sure you, you, you know, that case it's required. Um, the Supreme court, was more concerned about protecting the students t speech in this case, because they were c commenting about something political. Um, so if you were to wear a t-shirt that says marijuana should be legal, that's fine. You're expressing your opinion about a, a an important political topic, but just depicting a marijuana leaf, let's say, well, that is, that goes towards, um, advocating something that is technically still illegal. So the, the second example I just said could be punished. The first one, you're fine. Um, so it even shows up in our dress codes. And here I have a very short list uh, because the actual list would be much longer on impossible to list everything because symbolic speech is speaking through actions. And um, basically, you know, think of any action you might take uh, you can't necessarily get away with it by calling it free speech. Obviously the burning of the draft card case, uh, the person was punished. Uh, but anything that's normally criminal, uh, you know, you can't go around murdering somebody and say, Hey, I'm expressing my freedom of speech. Um, so 
you know, kind of like the um, free exercise clause. Anything that is normally considered criminal by society, you can't claim protection by the First Amendment. Uh, invasion of privacy. It's a relatively recent right that we're, we're, we think we're enjoying, but uh, basically you have a right to having certain things about you kept confidential, so uh, violating that right uh, in the name of free speech is often illegal. Uh, prank phone calls, I mean, another way of invading someone's privacy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, lots of examples could be produced there also. And on this slide, I just uh, kind of lumped together a bunch of things that I couldn't really figure out where they belong. Uh, graffiti is obviously a, uh, some people consider it an art form, some people consider it freedom of speech, but when you think about it, what somebody is doing is damaging someone's property, so uh, it can be punished. Um, saying things uh, when you're in a court setting and you've sworn to tell the truth, nothing but the truth and whatever it is, um, and you tell a lie, well, that's illegal. Uh, it's called perjury. Uh, it interferes with uh, other people's rights, especially the due process rights, because you're, 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 uh, you're messing up the legal system. Um, conspiracy. Um, conspiracy means planning using words and other actions to, to plan something. And if it's planning a crime, it doesn't matter if you actually get to the point where you commit the crime, planning in some sort of serious way to, to commit the crime later is itself a crime. Um, and you can't claim freedom of speech. Uh, campaign contributions, contributions, like we've said earlier, over a certain amount. Um, and then... Um, judicial gag orders, you hear about this every once in a while. Someone's involved in a trial, it might might be the defendant himself, um, it might be witnesses, it might be uh, the attorneys, it might be people in the, in the, in the jury. Uh, every once in a while uh, a judge is concerned that facts about a case might get into the, the public sphere and that might disrupt the case. Uh, so f you might hear once from time to time of people being under a judicial gag order, the word gag meaning you can't speak. So to quickly summarize, uh, no one's freedom of speech is absolute. There are lots and lots of exceptions to the freedom of speech. Uh, some of them are crimes, uh, some of them are subject to civil action, but the basic idea here is that uh, you do have a right, a right to freedom of speech, but other people have rights, the rest of society has rights, and those other people in, in society in general has to be protected. Some forms of speech cannot be allowed. Uh, three specific cases from this topic uh, could and probably will show up on the AP exam. Shank versus U.S., the clear and present danger test. Tinker versus Des Moines, uh, the, the student armband case uh, where symbolic speech by students was protected. And Citizens United versus SEC, where corporations and labor unions were allowed, after many years of not being allowed, allowed to spend freely on electioneering during elections. See, ya. See you in the next video.